Hey, good morning. It's really great to see you. And speaking of students, it's fun to have former students uh, make an art for us now. So uh, let's see here. About 16 years ago in February, I was at the time I was on staff at a church in Billings called Harvest, which was one of the mother churches uh, of this place. And we were still meeting in the cafeteria of Skyview High School. Uh, Skyview's the newer high school in Billings, way up in the Heights. And there were really two entrances into the cafeteria. There was kind of the main entrance that came from the parking lot, and then there was this kind of obscure one that, you know, people who attended there often knew where it was. And so I think it must have been between services. We had two at nine, <clears throat> or two services, one at nine, one at eleven. And I, I think it must have been between services. My memory is that my wife and I were, were sitting down. We were, we were in our mid-20s, I guess, and we were sitting down on the tile floor against the wall, kind of hiding behind the pot machine. So there was like a pot machine here, and then a 1,000 people down there, and then we were just kind of hunkered down and hanging out over here. And all of a sudden, we look up, and there's this woman. Uh, her, her name was Laura, and all of her chaos just kind of walked by us. And by all of her chaos, uh, she, she was a fantastic woman, this southern belle. Her and her husband, <clears throat> Randy, helped start Harvest, and they were this phenomenal couple who did high school ministry with Vern, who started the thing, and then transitioned into the launch team with them. But, th- but their story, and the reason why I say all of their chaos, chaos is because she was pushing a stroller, and it was one of those double strollers. And the reason she was pushing a dr- double stroller was because they were one of those couples that had tried for years to have kids, uh, weren't, weren't, weren't successful in that endeavor, and so they adopted a, a newborn, and then no sooner did they get the newborn that there was a high school girl actually from the community that we were part of that, that got pregnant, and so then they adopted that baby, and no sooner did they adopt the second baby, she got pregnant with twins. <laughs> yeah, so as she was pushing the stroller by us, she had four kids under three. So it was kind of this iconic, like, well, I don't know how bad it is. At least you're not Laura. Like that was kind of, <laughs> that, that's the way we referred to those guys. And so she's walking by and my, I think my wife, I think Teresa was, she must've been like seven or eight weeks or months pregnant. So we were sitting there. That was my excuse to be sitting down on the job, I guess. And she, she you know, in, in her Southern Belle, veteran mom, chaos, just really sweet self. She, she kind of walked, she saw, she walked towards us and she said, are you guys excited? And we're like, yeah, we're excited because this was going to be our first baby. And then she said, are you ready? And then she caught herself. And she, she like, I don't remember if she rebuked herself or she just stopped. There was this like, but it was clear, like, don't answer the question. And then she said, because you can't get ready, but when it happens, you're just ready. Now, I was talking to my wife about this Friday night. She doesn't remember that at all. But for me, it was like, thank you, God, I needed that moment. Uh, And and for me, it proved true. I've actually told friends, uh, especially guy friends, who were looking towards their first baby, because, you know, many of us are like, like, I'd never changed a diaper. I was the youngest in my family. I'd never held a newborn. It was like, I don't want to hold a newborn. I feel like I'll break it. It was like, I'd never done any of that. And then the moment Lincoln came out of the chute, it was just like, boom, this chemical change. And suddenly I was comfortable with all of it. And you know, didn't have to be told to do any of it and, and enjoyed it. But it raises this question, and this is the question that, that I kind of want to bring to the surface here this morning, or at least the idea. I suppose there's several questions. But it's like this idea of, uh, of what if life has a way of telling us that there's more in us than we know? And, and, and what, if, what if God has a way of pointing out that, that even if you don't know that and you can't see that, God can. And God, God does, in fact, see that. So we started this series last week. If you weren't with us, and you might have picked up, we're kind of framing around The Hobbit. You don't have to read The Hobbit. You can read The Hobbit. You can watch the movies if you want, though I think it takes longer to watch the movies than it does to read the book. Maybe not quite, but it seems like it. But we're kind of loosely tying all this stuff together, so we don't want you to feel left out if you're not reading The Hobbit, but all the same, you can if you want. I think there's a couple more copies back there. But what we started last week was just with this, I, I suppose, somewhat dichotomous question of, and I still brought advanced technology with me, of uh, how do you see God? You, you know, we've talked in years past about we all carry an image of God around with us. Uh, we talked this last Christmas Eve, like we, we all see through a certain lens, and, and whether you're a cradle atheist or a very proud fundamentalist evangelical, like the, the, the same one thing you have in common is we all, we all see God through a lens. And, and the question that we started with last week is, how, what, what does God primarily want for you? Or, or frankly, what do you primarily want from God? I, 
I think if I was being honest, I started following Jesus at 19 in large part because of this, this desire and need for safety and security. And we asked, like, is that, is, that, is that how we're most likely to meet God? Because the other option is, or, or, or is God's primary agenda with us, adventure and purpose. And we've kind of allowed, like, okay, false dichotomies are everywhere. This might be one. Neither one could be true to their extreme. But I think another way to ask this question is, like, is purpose and security and safety, is it an end unto itself? Because you know and I know and we see it on walls. Like, there's, there's a plethora of verses that offer the assurance of a God who's with you and God who will keep you safe and all those different things. But, but hopefully part of what we're beginning to pull out this, from this conversation and maybe what's coming out between your own conversations with, with friends and with God and with yourself and all those different interpersonal, intrapersonal, all that stuff is, like, are these promises and invitations from God, are they ends unto themselves? Or are they actually true to the degree that we're actually on adventure with God? I mean, even Jesus, his closing remarks, and I'll be with you always. And yet, I think if we're being honest, we have to remind ourselves that before he said, I'll be with you always, he told them to do some crazy stuff, like to go into the ends of the earth and, and invite people to understand God through this lens of Jesus. And so last week where we kind of left things and started things was this idea of, of where within this continuum uh, do we expect to meet God? And where are you expecting to meet God? Uh, have you heard of the 40% rule? Heard of that? I first learned of it this last fall. So my oldest, he was getting ready to play football this year, and there was this week right before football started where they I think they had to get staph infection out of the weight room or something like that. I don't know if that's actually true, but they had to do a deep cleaning of the weight room before the football season started. So he had these, don't get all paranoid, but I, I do think there's probably staph everywhere in those places. <laughs> in fact, I think there's some in my house. Um, but... There was a week where they couldn't go to the weight room, and he had orders like, hey, don't stop lifting before football starts on Friday. So he recognized that because my wife works at St. Pete's, we have a membership uh, to St. Pete's as a family, which is this great gift we got a couple years ago. But I, I'm, I'm a runner. I don't go to the gym. And he's like, Dad, will you go to the gym with me? Everybody else is out of town except for him. Will you go and work out? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go do that. And, and so we would go in the morning, and then I'd come home and run. Well, in that process, what I figured out, because I haven't lifted weights since high school. I'm sure that's news to you. Um, but <laughs> I actually started to figure out, like, I live two minutes from the gym, and you can get a lot of lifting done in 25 minutes, and frankly, I like the way I feel more when I do that and then run three or four miles versus run six or seven, so I'm giving you way more information than you need. But so this, so then I was talking to a friend uh, whose name was Jason about weightlifting and all this stuff, and he's uh, really deep into this stuff, and he turned me on to this podcast, and then one morning, I think it was in October, I was listening to this podcast, and this guy started talking about the 40% rule, and and what the 40% rule basically says is that at the point at which you mentally say you've had enough, like when your mind says you're done, you're exhausted, you can't possibly go any further, you're only about 40% there. That's the, and, and I gather that if you Google it, you find this under Navy SEALs a lot. It's this general idea of both mentally as well as physically when you think you're like maxed out, and so this is where this became relevant for me, was you know, you're sitting on the machine and you're doing your reps and you're like, okay, because I know enough to know like you go till you can't do anymore, but then I'm listening to this going, well, that's discouraging. <laughs> I guess that's why people hire people to yell at them while they're doing this because <laughs> uh, apparently I quit at 40%, so I started paying attention to it. And again, it's all relative to a, to a weight machine, but as what I started to recognize is, whoa, this is scary. Like I'm doing leg presses and I'm going, Okay, I'm done. I can't do any more. But if I can bear this in mind, I'm like, no, I can do like five more. Here's part of what I think this adventure conversation brings to the surface. What if God knows that's true of you in ways that you don't? And what if, and we explored this last week, that this God didn't just make us to be comfortable and secure, but this God who from the very beginning, he didn't hide anything. It's not like he's couched it and now he's springing on us. In the very first instances of the story, this God says that his dream, arms over your shoulders, is that you would be on mission with him, that you would be on adventure with him, that, that you'd be fruitful is, is the word the text uses. And what if one of the scary things is, is what, what you think is maxing out your fruitfulness, God goes like, hmm, but if you add me to the equation, if you let me push you a little bit, we can go way further than that. 
This is, for me, one of my favorite themes within the Hobbit series. And the reason we started doing this series, by the way, is several years ago I read the book and had some God encounters within it, and I had an Evernote of like, I could do a series, and here's these themes. And then this last fall I was doing something in Evernote, and I just found this note that I'd made, and I went like, whoa, it's there. I forgot all about this series. And I was like, sweet, we got a series for January. But one of the themes that, the, the, the way the Hobbit says it, or the way the book says it is on page 23. Let me just set the scene before we throw that up there in case you've not re- you don't, can't remember. But remember, there's, there's 13 dwarves. I called them elves earlier this week, and it was like, wow, because there's some, there's some purists out there. Um, <coughs> there's, so Gandalf, the wizard, is putting together this massive journey for these dwarves who are going to go reclaim some treasure. I'm just butchering the story. Some of you are like, oh, please stop. But, but all the same, Gandalf, the wizard, says, I'll find the last member of your party. He finds this guy named Bilbo, and they figure out Bilbo is kind of a coward and kind of weak and small. And so they're, they're agreeing with Bilbo, who's going, I'm not your guy. And on my book, on page 23, there's this line where Gandalf says, there's a lot more in him than you guess and a deal more than he has any idea of himself. We can go ahead to that. I've never stolen a thing in my life. Well, I'm afraid I have to agree with Mr. Baggins. He's hardly burglar material. Aye, the wild is no place for gentle folk who can neither fight nor fend for themselves. Enough! If I say Bilbo Baggins is a burglar, then the burglar he is. Hobbits are remarkably light on their feet. In fact, they can pass unseen by most if they choose. And while the dragon is accustomed to the smell of dwarf, the scent of a hobbit is all but unknown to him, which gives us a distinct advantage. You asked me to find the 14th member of this company, and I have chosen Mr. Baggins. There's a lot more to him than appearances suggest, and he's got a great deal more to offer than any of you know, including himself. You know, can you think of a time where you were just completely overwhelmed? Uh, I'm not asking for a current one. You can probably think of one you're in as well, but just for the sake of this, this principle, can you think of a time in your past where you were completely overwhelmed? Uh, maybe you lost your marriage. Maybe you lost your health. Maybe you lost someone you loved. Maybe it was an adventure of your choosing. Maybe you're graduating high school or, or you were choosing between this great job opportunity and that great job opportunity. Can, can you think of a time when you were completely overwhelmed? And then can you think of, like, because here you are, like, what, what proved to be true of you? And what proved to be true of God in that season? And what proved to be true of the people around you and the way that they would rally around you? And I wonder if, see, part of what I love about this principle, and again, I, I'm not suggesting that J.R.R. Tolkien is Jesus. I'm not suggesting he's saying Gandalf is Jesus. But to me, one of the really strong parallels, and since we learn things in stories, not in Proverbs, I think there's value to this story. But, but what if one of the real dangers is if we evaluate ourselves based upon whether or not we're up for the adventure, based upon what we see in the mirror? And what if the story over and over and over again, I don't need that yet, is of a God who goes, no, no, no. I see more in you than you see in yourself. I remember when I was 19, I was very new to following Jesus. I was standing in my grandpa's kitchen, and my aunt, my dad's sister, was there. And she's 10 years younger than him. In hindsight, the things you don't appreciate when you're 19, she had just lost her marriage. They had to move from South Carolina back to Billings. She was living in her parents' house. So she was eating her own humble pie at the time, if you know what I mean. And she was also the one that was instrumental in when I started to take God seriously, she's the one who introduced me to Fred, who became my mentor. She, she's, she's the one that took me to the church that I'd been light, loosely attending and kind of networked me with some of the pastors. And so we were standing in the kitchen, and, and she said, so, Adam, I mean, you know, I'm, a, I'm a couple months into this kind of life change stuff. I'm 19 years old, working for Coca-Cola, not going to college at the time. And she said, so, Adam, what are you going to do with your life? And kind of like Laura, she caught herself. And she, again, I don't remember if she rebuked herself. I don't remember how, how that part went. But then, but then she, she said, you know what, Adam? Don't sweat it. Enjoy your 20s. And she was the most, like, redheaded, like, blunt, like, serious person. And I, no offense if you're redheaded, but she's like the classic redhead, just tell it how, how she sees it kind of person. 
but there was so much grace. And she said, you know what, Adam, just, just enjoy your 20s. She said, work hard, stay out of debt, be careful with sex, pursue God, but just enjoy your 20s. And, and again, I've, I've obviously not forgotten this. And then she said, if you just stay true, if you just keep stepping forward, if you just keep, you know, work hard, get jobs, go to school, whatever it is you're going to do, pursue something. She said, by the time you're 30, you'll have it figured out. You, you'll know what you're supposed to do. And then she said, because you know what's true of all of us old people? None of us knew what we were going to do with our lives when we were 19 years old. And if you get the sense from any of them, if anyone tells you they did, just tell them they're liars. <laughs> they didn't know. And again, for me, th this was that moment. This, it's that principle, isn't it? Like, life requires there being these times where people see things in us that we don't see in ourselves, that we see a God that sees things in us that we don't see in ourselves. It reminds me a little bit of this story in the New Testament. There's this guy, Paul, who was instrumental in taking the gospel uh, to what we might call the Greek world or the Mediterranean world, and he was all kinds of brilliant and had all kinds of courage, and he would go to these communities and share the invitation of Jesus and the implications of what it would mean to follow him and be his apprentices, and then he would leave town, and these little churches would form. And there was this one little church that formed in this one uh, city called Philippi, and after he had left, he himself got himself in some trouble, like not of his doing, but there was some people who were really angry at him for following Jesus, and there was some jail involved, and Caesar and him were sideways. I mean, it was serious stuff. And in this town called Philippi, which was a pretty strategic Roman city at the time, that those people who decided they were going to start living their life through the, through the principles of Jesus, they started getting themselves in trouble, and there was some bad stuff starting to happen, and there was some outside uh, I, I don't know, philosophers, thinkers, therapists, friends, who started to say to them, like, certainly you've got God wrong. And their argument, their apologetic for the reason why they thought the Philippian church was wrong about God was because their life wasn't comfortable. And the argument was really simple. If you were really following God, then, then everything would work out. And if Paul was really God's voice, then his life would be working out. And so Paul wrote him this letter, and it's this really ironic letter uh, because it's one of the most joyful letters in the whole New Testament, and yet it's written from one of the most horrendous circumstances in the whole New Testament. It's the type of, if, if you're in your own kind of adventure, not of your choosing, it would be a great place to just drill down. You could read it in like 20 minutes. I got a new Bible last for Christmas, if you're wondering, what the heck is in your hands? I needed to switch versions, and my eyes are old. But at the beginning of this letter, Paul said this thing to them that uh, this has always been, for me, a go-to part of Part of the narrative. He says, I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. What's he doing? Hey, you know what? There's, there's more in you than you know. And when you connect with God, there's more in the two of you than you know. So, so don't just look in the mirror and decide whether or not you're up for the adventure based upon what you see. There's more to the equation than that. It reminds me of this other time. Jesus, at one point, he's hanging out with a bunch of people. I should just bring this over here, huh? Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of people, uh, and, and at one point, he, re he looks out and he recognizes, oh boy, we're a long ways from food. There's no McDonald's near here, and they're about to get hungry. And so he starts asking around, like, hey, anybody got any food? And some one per I, I, I think lots of people had food. One person was willing to share their food. And, and, but I don't know that. And this, they got this food from this one young gentleman, and Jesus multiplied it, and he fed thousands of people from it. You may have heard the story. You may not even believe the story. That's okay. But all the same, Jesus feeds these thousands of people with bread. Well, then there's like, it's a freak show after that, right? Because... Because now suddenly they're not interested in Jesus because of what he's teaching about God. They're interested in Jesus because they're like, well, I don't have to go to work tomorrow. If I just hang out next to this guy, we'll eat. And the other thing that's going on there is uh, in Jesus' day, when, when Caesar would conquer a village or when there was a village that Caesar wanted to kiss up to, uh, one of the things he would do is he'd call Cisco and he would arrange for several trucks to show up into town and they would just empty from the back of the trucks heaps and heaps and heaps of bread. I mean, obviously it wasn't Cisco, but literally that, that's what he would do. And it was his way of saying, see, I bring peace and I bring provision. So when Jesus does all that minus the trucks, there, there's, there's par part of what we see here then is this sociopolitical controversy that Jesus is kind of pushing but trying not to push. And so he kind of gets a little nervous. So he says to his followers, these, these 12 disciples anyway, he says, hey, you guys need to get out of Dodge. So he puts them in a boat and they, they are sailing away from there. And Jesus decides at the last minute not to go with them. And, and all the people who are watching all this transpire, they recognize 
Jesus didn't get in the boat, but they, I don't know if they respect him or whatever, but he kind of goes and gets alone by himself with God. He, he spends the evening watching the boat, praying a little bit. And then this is the moment where he finally decides he's going to go and he walks on water. Again, more stuff that you don't even know if you can believe. But Jesus walks on water. He goes to them. Then Peter kind of walks on water and kind of becomes fish food. And then eventually they arrive at Capernaum. Well, the next day, the people who were where Jesus was are like, where does Jesus go? They start looking for him. Eventually they find him. And in John 6, they, 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 they finally find Jesus and there's this really important interaction that follows that I, I just want to read to you. It says, so, so, well, I'm in John 5. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not what I'm supposed to be reading. So the, the, the crowd found him. Uh, man, what is happening here? When they found him, blah, 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 Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you're, you're looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him God the Father has set his seal. So then they asked the logical question, like, okay, so what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now, if you've been sitting in church for any length of time or living in the U.S., then what that verse means is probably all messed up in your head. Because what we've been programmed to believe, and we talked about this a little bit and what the gospel is and isn't in a series this last fall, is that, okay, so what Jesus is saying is if you, if you believe, if you give intellectual assent, if you believe that the tomb was empty and the cross occurred and that Jesus is God, then when you die, you go to heaven. And fundamentally, that can't be what they heard him say. Because at the very least, those things hadn't occurred yet. What does Jesus say? Hey, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. What does that mean? It gets at the idea of trust, right? Like, you, you know what it means to believe in another person, to trust another person, to have confidence in another person. And you know what it means to have no confidence in them. And while Jesus is God, and I, I think the greatest human intellect ever, while the tomb was in fact empty in my belief, while the cross is of vital importance, I think one of the things that we can miss in our culture is that to believe in Jesus is to have confidence in him. That, that, which would mean that in addition to all the other things that we do when, when we're trying to analyze an adventure of our choosing or of God's, in addition to the therapists and the books and the podcasts and the friends, one of the invitations is to turn to the person and this is where I think Dallas Willard's work is so important because he's constantly reminding us, don't forget, he was the greatest human intellect ever. He had more moral understanding than any human ever has. What's the invitation? To have confidence in him. Which gets back to this, there's this adventure thing and there's this, I can't do this. And Jesus is going, good news, you don't have to do this. Not only is there more in you than you think, but I'll be with you. Several years ago, there was a friend back in Billings, it was actually a friend of a friend, who wrote the whole check for me to go to this conference in California called Ultimate Leadership. And you've probably heard me talk about it if you've been around here for a while, but it was, it's Henry Cloud and John Townsend, these kind of premier Christian psychologists, uh, they're, they're premier Christian leadership, or it's, I guess it's not even Christian, just their, their leadership conference. Uh, but the, the catch is, there's about two hours a day of instructional didactic, uh, conference stuff, and then there was like six to eight hours a day for five days of full-on psychotherapy. So what I knew about the conference was I was going to fly in to California on Sunday, check myself into a hotel. Monday through Friday, I'd spend the first couple hours of the day in a classroom setting with 40 or so people, and then I'd spend the next six to eight hours of the day for five days with this group of people, and then what they do is they hire all these psychotherapists from the region, and so or a bunch of them, and so you would go spend three hours with one psychotherapist, and then you'd leave that room, and you'd get a glass of water, and then you'd go three hours with the next one, and the whole point was, of course, that they'd crack you open and tear you apart and do all that, like, mom, dad kind of stuff, with the idea being that when you left on Friday, you were new. So it's kind of like climbing Everest, like, I like the idea of the view, but the week kind of sounds like hell. So... I was sitting in the airport. I remember it was after church on Sunday, and the, the travel thing in and of itself for me is, is not my favorite thing by myself, not to mention going to this thing that I don't know what in the world's going to happen. 
but I kind of do and what I know I don't like. So I remember sitting in the airport, <clears throat> and, and I remember having this thought of like, I don't, I don't actually have to get on the airplane. I mean, I'll have some explaining to do, and my tail will be tucked firmly between my legs, but I don't have to get on the airplane. And then I remembered uh, this, this principle, and I think this was a God thing, but we'd had a guy named Paul Young. Some of you may remember him from the shack. He had been here, and I remember in that lobby between, I think it was actually when the band was rehearsing, he and I had this conversation, and one of his phrases was this idea of future tripping. And I remember him saying, Adam, do you know how many times I've been to my own funeral? you know how many times and how many different ways my kids have died? you know how many different ways that, that I've not been able to pour, uh, pay my mortgage? And then he had this phrase. He said, what I think this thing is about is learning this is the way he said it, learning to live within the grace of the day. And in that moment, I, I, for whatever reason, I remembered the manna, which I, I don't know if you remember this. Sorry, I think. Um, I don't know if you remember this story from Exodus, but there's this point where Moses has led Israel out of Egypt, and they start freaking out. I think it's like 40 days in. They're freaking out, like, what are we going to eat? Cactus? Well, you know, I mean, that's hipster food, but that's not us food. Like, we don't want to eat this stuff. And they want to go back to Egypt, and then God, God actually said... To, to Moses, he says, go, hey, go, go, go tell him this. And, and this is in Exodus 16. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. So well, what's the test? Well, the principle is pretty clear, right? You're going to wake up in the morning there's going to be food on the ground. I know this is crazy stuff. I think the word actually means what is it. So even scholars debate this one. But the, 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 the narrative is they're going to wake up in the morning and there's going to be enough food on the ground for that day. Not for tomorrow. And then the next day, same thing. And then once a week, there'll be enough for two days, but that's because Sabbath, they're not supposed to work on Sabbath. And the dialogue that happened for me, and I feel like when I'm healthy, this is where I live. The dialogue that happened for me in the airport that day was this. Adam... Forget Monday, forget Tuesday, forget Wednesday, forget Thursday, forget Friday. Do you think there's enough in you and enough from you and from God that you can get on this airplane, fly to Salt Lake, get off that airplane, fly to Southern California, get off that airplane, find the van to the hotel, and just fall into bed when you get there? Do you think there's enough in you for that? And I remember, I remember th this internal dialogue of like, yep, I can do that. Because I, I know enough to know that like grace comes new in the morning, you know? So, and then Monday, that, that was the game I played. Not, not, not thinking about Tuesday, not thinking about Wednesday. Adam, do you think there's enough to go down to the gym and get on a treadmill, even though you hate treadmills, and then come up and eat breakfast and go to that didactic? And then do you think, do you think God will be faithful no matter how uncomfortable and how much crying there is and how much crazy stuff is happening around you in these psycho sessions? Do, do you think there's enough to just fall into bed tonight? I remember going, yep. And then on Tuesday, like, on, I don't know about you, but about midway through the trip, I start catastrophizing what happens if I miss my flight when I leave. <laughs> There's just like, nope, nope, nope. What, 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 is it, what if following Jesus isn't as complicated as we make it? What if it's a God who would love to take us on adventure? Sometimes of our choosing, sometimes not of our choosing, and what if this God knows there's more in you than you realize and that you plus God is capable of far more than you could ever dream of? And what if you, in the midst of that, whatever it is you're facing, again, awesome adventure like graduating from high school or this really scary thing your family is facing together, is there enough in you to just embrace the adventure with God? Not tomorrow, not next week, just just today, to live within the grace of a day, to avoid future tripping. So what's the adventure God has for you? And what does it look like for you to be faithful to that adventure today? I'd like to pray for you. God, thanks, Lord, that the human story is, is written by you and that though we face new culture and new times and new dates on the calendar, really we face the same thing that all humans have faced. How are we going to live? Who are we going to live for? How, how, how much are we going to trust you? 
How are we going to define what it means to believe in Jesus? How safe are we going to play it? And God, I just ask that there would, uh, there would be a unique movement of you in our hearts this week where we could just be prompted, maybe even memorized just for the sake of, of being prompted, this, the principle of the manna. That, that you invite us to live within the needs of the day. And that if we can do that, then we probably can go further than we think. We love you, God. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.